for fresh air and the following message come from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to refinancing your existing mortgage or buying a home, Rocket Mortgage lets you understand all the details so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Go to rocketmortgage.com slash fresh air. From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. Today, Bridget Everett talks about her raunchy comedy cabaret act that showcases her wild sexual humor, her beautiful singing voice, and her six-foot-tall plus-sized body. Physically, I'm different. I don't see a lot of people on stage that are wearing plunging, you know, a gown that goes all the way down to their navel that are built like me, that are swinging it all around. (laughs) Like somebody used to call me a cabaret hurricane. Everett co-stars in the new film, Patty Cakes. And we hear from John Cho, who's best known for his role as Harold in the stoner comedy Harold and Kumar. When the writer told Cho he wrote the part for him... Then I thought it was a hoax. I thought, no white guy is writing a movie for an Asian, a Korean-American guy. That's not possible, is it? This is a joke. Cho stars in the new film Columbus. That's coming up on Fresh Air. Gregory Warner here to tell you about NPR's new international podcast. It's called Rough Translation. Each week, we're going to take you to a different country to hear a story that reflects back on something that we are talking about here in the United States. Maybe get a perspective shift. Travel with us. Rough Translation is on NPR One or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. My guest is Bridget Everett who Amy Schumer described as her absolutely bar none favorite performer to see live. Everett has been featured on Schumer's TV series and was in Schumer's movie Trainwreck. Everett's comedy cabaret act was described in Vogue as vaudeville meets raunchy storytelling set to filthy, hilarious, and really pretty vocals. I'll add that sometimes in the middle of a beautiful ballad, she'll do something sexually crude, Her costumes are designed to comically reveal as much of her six-foot body as possible. In 2015, she received a special citation at the Obie Awards, the Off-Broadway Theater Awards. She's collaborated with Adam Horowitz from the Beastie Boys and musical songwriters Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman. Now she's co-starring in the new movie Patty Cakes. Her character, Barb, used to be in a local rock band that never made it. She's become bitter, relegated to singing at a local dive bar in New Jersey. Her daughter wants to make it as a rapper, but Barb is uninterested in rap and assumes that her daughter will also be crushed by her unfulfilled dreams. Here's a scene from the film. Barb is at the bar singing an 80s song. I went to a party last Saturday night. I didn't get I got in the fight. Uh-huh. It ain't no big thing. But I know what I like. I know I like dancing with you. And you know what I like. That's Bridget Everett singing in the new movie, Patty Cakes. Bridget Everett, welcome to Fresh Air. Have you sung, Hi, thanks for having me. Have you sung in a lot of bars like this one? Have you sung karaoke in a lot of bars? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's where I spent my formative years. I mean, by formative years, I mean my 20s and 30s. But yeah, I love a karaoke bar. So this role in Patty Cakes is, to my knowledge, your first big role where, like, you know, you, you, you're a leading character. Are there things you had to learn in preparation for the movie? Yeah, you know, I I'd, I'd never done a dramatic role before and so I and I've never taken an acting class or anything. But um Jeremy, the writer director of Patty Cakes, um was involved in the Sundance Labs and thought that I should come and give it a shot. He saw me singing on Inside Amy Schumer and you know, running around and 
you know, being wild and stuff. And he's like, you should be the mother in my movie. And um, he kind of just took the pressure off. He's like, come to Sundance, you know, don't worry about getting it wrong. Just come here. And and, and I, I, th- I think this is all going to work out. And so I just took the chance. Was there anything that you drew on as the mother in this movie from your own experiences or from your experiences with your own mother? Yeah, you know, Barb is equal parts um, Bridget frustrated as a waitress for many years and and my mom who, you know, was a single mother and and bitter, you know, and sort of the the drinking part to um to get you through pain is not something that was too hard to um to uh tap into and then also the um you know I feel like Barb is really lonely and 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 you know my both my dad and sister had died a couple of years ago and and I don't know I guess I just had some sadness I needed to work through and and Barb kind of helped me do that in the movie, your character, the mother, kind of blames her own daughter for the end of her singing career, for the end of the mother's singing career, because she was a single mother and she couldn't, she couldn't pursue her dreams. She had to raise her child. Yeah. And, and the daughter knows this. It's like not the best way to establish a great relationship with your daughter to blame yeah. them for, for shattering your dream. It's so mean. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that your mother didn't do that to you. No, no, no. My mom didn't do that. But I can relate to blaming anybody but yourself, you know, for not achieving what you want. You know, I think that that's something that probably a lot of people can relate to. But um, my mom wasn't like that. I'm I'm uh, I'm her favorite. Did, <laughs> did, did you have a list of people who you blamed for for a few years before you established yourself? Oh, just about everybody but myself. <laughs> I was like, the audience doesn't understand me. Comedy clubs don't want to, you know, they don't want to book me. Agents don't want me. You know, They don't understand me, you know. Like, there was, yeah, for sure, anger and frustration. Um, but I guess that's why I love the, you know, I loved the gay community so much because they just um, accepted me. So I want you to describe your cabaret act. Um, you know, it's sort of like a rock and roll, punk rock cabaret, lots of tender moments and money notes. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's a wild ride for sure. And it's definitely blue and it's not for everybody. But, but um, I also try to mix in, you know, stories that are, you know, the part of the pain and part of the stuff that keeps me, you know, ticking. So it's not just all in your face. But, um, you know, I sing and write my songs and all that, too. It is literally in your face. Like, you put yourself in people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and when you say it's blue, it's not just like language blue. It's like physically blue. You reveal a lot of yourself emotionally and physically on stage. Yeah. Um, so how did, how did you arrive at that persona, at the person on stage who's almost like aggressively sexual with the, with the audience? Um, I think that just for so many years, I couldn't get um, anyone to listen to me, you know, or or, or a, a job singing. And all I ever really wanted to be was a singer. Um, the persona sort of came on as an afterthought. Um, I just, you know, I was singing in karaoke bars and I was getting up on top of the bar and like ripping my shirt open and just going nuts. And then uh, I found cabaret and the performance art scene in New York and people were just so wild and so alive. I was like, Oh my God, this is what I've been waiting for. And so I don't know. I I feel like it's not meant to be like sexually explicit. It's more meant to be about the power of owning your own body and, and who you are, you know, and, and that's who I am. I'm just, you know, I've always sort of had a blue sense of humor and, um, I'm, I'm not, really ashamed of my body or at least my stage persona isn't (laughs) and um i want i it's just a different way of gaining acceptance i suppose were you ever shy or inhibited about your body um not really i grew up um as a swimmer you know and so i was in locker rooms all the time and i'm the youngest of six kids and everybody just kind of walked around in their underwear or some form of 
you know, disrobed in some way. <laughs> um, it just wasn't a big deal. Um, and I probably have like some kind of reverse body dysmorphia. I probably look a lot better in my head than I really do, but um, I'm happy with it and it's paying the bills. <laughs> so there's the audience who comes to see, see you because they know who you are and they want what yeah. you are offering. And there's the audience who kind of stumbles into seeing you and they ha have no idea what they're in store for. So what kind of response do you get from people who, who, sh who kind of showed up without really knowing how raunchy your act really is? Yeah, well, you know, I, there's... It's not like I haven't had people walk out, and I, I kind of like that because it's like, you know, I want people to have a reaction. I'm, I'd am i rather be doing something that thrills people, people or, you know, disgusts them. <laughs> um, but honestly, the audience is what shaped my performance. They kept wanting more and more of me, and I just kept giving them till I got – giving it to them until I felt I'd found, like, my sweet spot and, and my voice. So – you know, people will come back again and again, and sometimes they'll bring their mother or their grandmother or their kids or something. And it's kind of insane. But when I go out on the road and, like, people bring their, their grandmothers, you know, I'm talking, like, the, on this last tour I did, there were a lot of, like, roses for some reason. It'd be like, Rose, hey, Rose, what are you doing here tonight? How old are you? And I'm 90. And she would just, like, bring down the house every time. It's, it's fun when you can get somebody like that to um, unlock and let go. Well, let's take a short break here, and then we'll talk some more. If you're just joining us, my guest is Bridget Everett, and she co-stars in the new film, Patty Cakes. We'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. Support for Fresh Air and the following message come from the Platinum Card from American Express. There's a whole breathtaking and surprising world out there, and no other card lets you experience it like the Platinum Card, backed by the service and security of American Express. So um, I want to play one of your songs from this is the, from an album that you recorded, and this is a song you often perform in your act, and you did it on your Comedy Central special, um, mm. which was called Gynecological Wonder, which helps give <laughs> an idea that gives of you your a little, act. <laughs> a little taste, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, w why don't you talk a little bit about Stay With Me? Um, you know, I wanted to... I wanted to play something beautiful, and I wanted to also play something that we could play on the air. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Stay With Me, I wrote with my guitar player, Mike Jackson, and I wanted it to be, like, last call at the bar and sort of have, like, um, a romantic 70s kind of vibe or something. And, um, I, you know, I just... Uh, I wanted it to be, like, a love song, but a love song that was on in my way of doing it. Okay. So this is Bridget Everett singing Stay With Me. Sit with me Don't be lonely tonight Oh, please Take my hand We'll dance under the moon As slow as we can Or stay right here Till the night is through Cause there ain't nothing in this world But me and you Cause tonight You're all I need You stay that's Bridget Everett singing Stay With Me. I mean, that's that's really beautiful. Did you try for a straight singing career for a while? Like, what did you do to try for just a straightforward singing career? Well, I went to school and I studied opera. I got my degree in vocal performance. And then I moved to New York so I could, like, you know, try Broadway and all that. And I got my equity card really quick doing um, a children's theater tour. But I quickly realized that it just wasn't for me. There was, you know, there's not a lot of roles for somebody like me and and I just was more what do you suited mean, to somebody like, like you well I'm I'm six foot 
tall. I'm like, I've got a, a big build, you know, I'm, I don't, I can't think of anybody that sort of looks like me that was up on the Broadway stage a lot, you know, and I can't dance. And, um, you know, I just, I just sort of felt like I had to make a path for myself. And so I just started singing and telling stories and, and got into the that cabaret life. <laughs> and I don't know, I just, um, I'm really happy that I found it because it's like, it's just changed. It's just opened up my heart and my world and everything. I love it so much. When you were studying opera, did you expect to become an opera singer, or was that just a good way of um, learning as much as you could about your voice and how to uh, use it? It was a good way to get out of Kansas, you know, uh, I got a yeah. scholarship. And, um, but yeah, I really wanted to learn how to do it the right way because I used to lose my voice a lot, and um, I wanted to learn how to be a really good singer. I just love singing so much, and so it was good to get like the you know the mechanics of how to do it right. But I I realized that like I would take the languages, you know, that's all part of the curriculum, and I just I have no retention. I can't retain languages. And I'm like I'm on, I'm in the wrong I'm in the wrong line of work. I got to get out of here. <laughs> um, and I didn't feel really that I, I loved singing an aria. It'd be super exciting, but not like I felt when I was on top of a karaoke bar. So I just figured how to translate that into a job. Do you feel like you know how to sing powerfully without shredding your voice because of your opera training? Yeah, that and um, I took um, I also took voice lessons from uh, Liz Kaplan, who's a, you know she teaches everybody on Broadway and a lot of rock stars in New York, and um, she really helped change the way that I was doing things. And I take it all very seriously. Like before a show, I'm I spend an hour doing stretches and warming up. I do vocal cool downs, and then that way it gives me the um you know the flexibility to go on stage and just act like a a, a wildebeest and walk <laughs> away with <laughs> walk away with my cords intact. What are some of the things she taught you? You know, she does that. She has um I think a background in the Alexander technique, and so it's sort of like about your body. And my my college teacher Darlene Cleaver Britton also did that too. And I think like when I it's a kind of, po- of posture of, technique, so that yeah, uh, your, so your, your your breath is aligned yeah. with your body, and yeah, and that's really so important. And I think when I was younger, I was just like, just thinking from the neck up, and that's not that's not the way to do it. You're going to get yourself in a whole lot of trouble if that's the way you're working. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, what's the music that most inspired you when you were coming of age? Oh, I really love Barry Manilow. <laughs> And uh, I also loved, like, Freddie Mercury and Debbie Harry and, you know, of course, Bette Midler. I just liked people that, you know, like when you see, like, Freddie Mercury perform, like how sort of he just seemed like his own particular thing, you know, and he's kind of wild and looked a little different. And it just gave me a lot of hope that there was a, a space for me somewhere. Where does Barry Manilow fit him fit in? Because he's more of like a songwriter craftsman and yeah. and pop singer. Um it seems really different than what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's like the unabashed, like um, not melancholy. Well, I'm, I'm kind of think, trying to think what the right word is, but just like he just says what's on his heart and mind, you know. And I really like that, and I love all the key changes and just the drama of it. And you know, it's this. It's sort of the soundtrack of my youth. My uh, there was a lot of nights where I'd my mom would be sitting in her blue chair having a scotch and I'd be brushing her hair and we'd be listening to Manilow and she'd be crying and I don't know, it just sort of brings me back to the, the sweet life. <laughs> your, your mother was a music teacher, right? Yeah. She's a retired music teacher and... Um, Singing? She um, she taught like, you know, elementary school music and then she taught privately after school, um, you know, piano lessons, guitar, like basically everything. And she... You know, call in high school she wouldn't let me take a computer class, but I was taking three credits of music. You know, show choir and and then choir choir and then some other music class. And she just always, you know, music was always in our house. And when we were growing up, like you know, my we had a you know, like everybody, sort of a, a tricky. Uh, you know, parents got divorced and all that. And but the best times were like singing and drinking around the piano and singing Manilo or Lionel Richie or show tunes. And it's just, uh, it's just the sweet spot. So did she teach you music? 
She didn't really, but we would, you know, she insisted that we would, you know, practice a half hour a day on the piano. And, um, you know, if you played a wrong note, she'd be like, F sharp out from the kitchen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she'd, you know, she definitely cracked the whip and made sure that we kept at it. So um, I'm wondering if you were influenced by performers in gay clubs. Oh, yeah. Um, that's what changed my my life. When I moved to New York, I, my friend took me to um, Fez and the Time Cafe, and and that's where I saw Murray Hill and Kiki and Herb, and um, I was a big fan of um, Sweetie, who's a drag queen who passed away just a few months ago. And just like the sort of vital nature of their performance and just like the, you know, not to be corny, but like the coloring outside of the lines kind of thing and crawling on tables and just you know, sometimes just totally sick humor, <laughs> but also, you know, the ones that I responded to were the ones that just had a, a lot of heart sort of pulsating underneath it. And, um, yeah, I didn't know that that existed living in Kansas and then going to school in Arizona. So um, they are constantly inspiring me, for sure. Um, what are the things that made you feel most different when you were in front of audiences, not not gay audiences, but audiences who you felt weren't getting what you did. I think like I'm I'm physically I, I'm different. I don't see a lot of people on stage that look like me. I don't see a lot of people on stage that are you know wearing plunging you know a gown that goes all the way down to their navel that are built like me that are swinging swinging it all around. <laughs> you know I think like. I am, um, and then just like going out into the audience and just being like a, a just a, a a wild child. Like somebody used to call me a cabaret hurricane. It's like um, I just didn't see that, and I just feel like um, I don't know why, but queer out audiences just ate it up and just and treated me like I belonged there. My guest is Bridget Everett. She stars in the new movie Patty Cakes. We'll talk more after a break, and we'll hear from actor John Cho, co-star of the Harold and Kumar movies and the Star Trek reboot and star of the new movie Columbus. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Madison Reed, revolutionizing the way women color their hair with an ammonia-free formula in over 40 multidimensional shades delivered right to your door on your schedule. Because gorgeous salon quality hair color is even more beautiful when it saves you time and money. Find your perfect shade at madison reed.com. Madison Reed is honoring Fresh Air listeners with 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with promo code Fresh Air. During the years you wanted a singing career and didn't have one, you worked as a waitress. What kind of restaurants did you work? I worked at Ruby Foo's on the Upper West Side for 10 years. I opened it and closed it, and then I worked at a, another restaurant on the Upper West Side. Um, yeah, I waited tables or worked in a restaurant for, for 25 years before I finally got to quit about two years ago. That's really recent, two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It was... Um, I, I kept it a little bit longer than I might have needed to because I had health insurance, but I needed the money. I'm, you know, it's... Touring is like while you're sort of trying to tour around and not making a lot of money, you're just trying to get people to understand what cabaret is and not be scared of that or the kind of performer I was. You know, I, I needed to um, I needed to make a little cash. So what were the best and worst aspects of being a waitress? Like what did you hate most when somebody behaved in a certain way or asked you for a certain thing? Yeah, what I hated was that I felt like I should be on stage singing, and so I just started to resent everybody around me. And I was, you know, I was 42 and 40, you know, I think 42 or 43 when I quit waiting tables. And I'm, like, walking around, and there's all these 20-year-olds, you know, that are have the same job as I do, and their future is looking so bright. And I'm like, God, am I, am I like, is this ever going to happen for me? It's, like, the only time I would ever question what I was doing, like, was when I was on the clock waiting tables. And people just, you know, they... Most people are lovely, but there's just a lot of monsters out there <laughs> that don't, you know, they don't think of you as a human. Um, but I met some great people, and I got a really sick knowledge of wine when I was waiting tables. <laughs> <laughs> was that because you could drink it at the bar because you were supposed to taste it so you'd know what the wine menu was? 
Oh, yeah. They used to call me the wine whisperer because I could, you know, smell a glass and know, the, you know, the grape, the region, all that business. I've sort of lost that, but um, I took a lot of pride in that. And you're still drinking a lot of wine. You drink on stage. I was wondering, like, what's in the bottle? Not just on stage, Terry. (laughs) (laughs) I was wondering, what's in the bottle? You know, is it water or is it scotch or is it wine? Uh, It's Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. I'm a... I love to drink Rombauer Chardonnay, um, but it's it's not cheap, so um, sometimes I have to downgrade a little bit. But yeah, that's um, that's Mother's Juice, and uh, I also like to have that at home when I'm sitting on the couch with my dog Poppy watching documentaries. Do I need to worry about you that you're drinking too much? <laughs> <laughs> probably. That's a that's a probably a valid concern. I try to. Um, I have DNDNs. They're called uh, designated non-drinking nights, just to uh, try to keep myself in check. Because you mentioned your mother drank a lot too. Yeah, she, um, but you know, she quit the game probably a little too late, but she, she quit. And, um, yeah, she, uh, I come from a family of people that like to imbibe. Is that the right word? Yeah. It, it strikes <laughs> me that there's probably a fine line between drinking enough and drinking too much when you're on stage. Drinking enough to lose the inhibitions you want to lose, but not drinking so much that you actually lose your place. You know, that you lose, For sure. you lose your train of thought. You lose your command of the act. Yeah, I've done that before, and I don't like that. I mean, I, I it's really, for me, it's about nerves. I get so nervous before I go on stage, so I have a little bit to... You know, I think it was um, Elaine Stritch that said, uh, why would I go out there all by myself or something like that? Or I don't want to be out there alone. Um, but, yeah, there's like a certain amount that I know that uh, where it's where my it's my sweet spot. It almost seems counterintuitive that you'd be nervous since you're so, you, you know, I almost want to use the word exhibitionistic on stage. And you seem to like enjoy being on stage so much. Yeah, it does seem a little nuts, but like literally before every show, I turn to my band. I'm like, "Why are we doing this? Why do we do? Why am I doing this to myself?" And you know, I get like the, the jelly thighs, and like, a lot of times, if I'm performing at a venue, I've never performed out. I do that thing where you blur your eyes, you know, and you can't really see what's in front of you, and you know, I'm like spraying wine and acting like a maniac, but I'm terrified inside for the first five minutes. You single out people and bring them onto stage to either dance or put people's heads onto your chest. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, like, if you ever choose the wrong person, <laughs> like the person who, like, is very shy about this kind of thing and wants to see your performance but doesn't really want to be a part of it because they're just not that kind of person. You know what I mean? They're, they want to just sit and watch. They don't want to have other people be looking at them. Yeah, I think by that point in the show, people, you can sort of tell who's who's going to be willing to, um, How can to you go tell? all the way. I don't know. It's like you don't want somebody that's like, pick me, pick me, pick him, pick him. And you don't want somebody that's just like white knuckled clinging to their seat. You know, there's someone that lies in the middle that's kind of just kind of looking at you. Like, you know, when I walk through the audience, if somebody's looking down, but there'll always be somebody that just sort of peeks up a little and I'm like, Perfect. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> or there's been somebody that I've been talking to throughout the show and sort of getting to know them. And that is often the person I pick. But um, I've, I've gotten pretty good at it. I mean, I've had a couple um, missteps. I remember I was sitting on some guy's lap one time and he was older because I love I, I just love the sort of the, AAR, the AARP set. <laughs> I'm always so delighted when they come to the, this kind of show. And I was sitting on his lap and he whispered in my ear. I just had my knee replaced. Oh, so, like, <laughs> so there's always something like that, you know. But <laughs> um, but um, I tried. I think I've gotten pretty good at it. Well, how did you respond when you found out about his knee replacement? Oh, I freaked out. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, just it, it, I felt horrible, you know, and he was fine, you know. But uh, I made a big, uh, a big stink about it. Stop the song. Cut the track. Cut the track. What have I done? <laughs> Well, Bridget Everett, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. This was a delight. Thanks for having me. Bridget Everett stars in the new movie Patty Cakes, and she has a new pilot called Love You More that will be on Amazon starting September 1st. After we take a short break, we'll hear from John Cho. He's Harold in the Harold and Kumar films and Sulu in the Star Trek reboot. He stars in the new film Columbus. This is Fresh Air. 
I'm Linda Holmes. And I'm Stephen Thompson. There's more stuff to watch and read these days than any one person can get to. That's why we make Pop Culture Happy Hour. Twice a week, we sort through the nonsense, share reactions, and give you the lowdown on what's worth your precious time and what's not. Find Pop Culture Happy Hour on the NPR One app or wherever you get your podcasts. Our next guest, actor John Cho, may be best known for playing Harold in the Harold and Kumar stoner comedy films, or for his role in the recent reboot of the Star Trek films, playing Sulu, the role originated by George Takei. Now Cho stars in the film Columbus, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year. He plays Jin, who's estranged from his father, a scholar in architecture. Just before the father is supposed to give a talk in Columbus, Indiana, he has a stroke and falls into a coma. Jin is called to Columbus from Seoul, South Korea, to be at his father's side, and once there, he feels obligated to stay. Jin befriends Casey, a young woman interested in architecture. Casey wants to leave Columbus to study architecture, but feels that her mother, a recovering addict, needs her to stay. John Cho spoke with Fresh Air producer Anne-Marie Boldenato. They started with a scene from Columbus. Jin and Casey, played by Haley Lou Richardson, are discussing Jin's dad, who remains in a coma in the hospital. Do you think he's got a chance to recover? Even if it's just enough to, to go back to Seoul? I hope not. What? Truth is, if I were in Korea, I'd be expected to be there when he died and to express sorrow in the most dramatic fashion. There's this belief that if you're not there when a family member dies and not adequately grieving, your spirit will roam aimlessly and become a kikri. A ghost. Of course, my dad didn't believe in that. Shit. It still would be expected of me. John Cho, welcome to Fresh Air. Thank you for having me. So that scene in particular, you can um, feel the character struggling with what the right thing to do is, what it's like to be a dutiful son. And what's great about this movie for you, for people who followed your career, is that you get to do something that I don't feel like we've seen you do before, um, sort of get deep like this. Was that difficult? Was it sort of hard to sort of deal with these issues of family and obligation? I think particularly immigrant children have to deal with this uh, clash of cultures, what's expected from their parents from this culture that they didn't grow up in. I remember reading uh, as a kid uh, the Judy Bloom book, uh, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. <laughs> and I remember reading uh, Peter, the main character, was told to uh, go to your room by his parents. And uh, he said, um, be glad to, and stormed off to his room. And I thought, wow, that was cool. And uh, I was told that by my Korean immigrant parents, go to your room one night. And I pulled that out of my hat. I said, be glad to, and promptly received a thrashing. It didn't go over <laughs> a full on the same way <laughs> as it did for it Peter. Was, uh, oh, you were in trouble then. Oh, you're in trouble now, kid. So, yeah, <laughs> I've been thinking about that in some form, this cultural disconnect between uh, parent and child all my life. One thing that's interesting in the film is, you know, um, Jin's father, who's sick, was an architectural historian and architecture expert. Um, and at one point, Jin says that he hates architecture, um, I think, sort of as a reaction to what his parent loved. I hate Benny Goodman, <laughs> they, they used to say. <laughs> I prefer the stones. So, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about that. I, and I was wondering if that factored into acting at all. Um, I'll put it out there, you know, Asian Americans sometimes get pushback if they want a career in the arts. Oh, yes. Um, I, you know, I think my parents were surprisingly cool with me entering the arts, although I, I think they thought it was uh, going to be a phase and they didn't expect me to, to actually stick with it. Um, 
and rightfully so they were they were concerned whether I could uh you know afford groceries being an actor but you know I've said this before like I I I feel like immigrants sometimes you know they're they're such risk takers because I can't imagine moving to another country and they're pioneers they're cowboys and yet they often encourage really conservative choices and uh from their children so I want to ask you a little bit about your background. You were born in South Korea and moved to the U.S. when you were around six. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, do you remember that move? Um, was it difficult to make that big move? I do. I, 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 I remember it. You know, I, I was young enough to where I could learn the language pretty quickly. And as a kid, you're very adaptable. Uh, but I remember being traumatized going mm. to that first day of school and not knowing the language. Um, I mean, it's just crazy to think about now because um, I have children of my own and, and thinking about dropping my kid off at a school where he didn't know how to communicate with anyone. He couldn't tell, you know, if he if he was hurt, uh, he wouldn't be able to express that. But um, on the other hand, you know, I learned how to swim, that's that's for sure. When did you realize that you wanted to pursue acting as a career? Um, I fell into acting in college, and then I did a professional show while I was in college uh, called The Woman Warrior. It was based upon the book of the same title. And um, it was there that I met actual, live, human-being Asian-American actors and I thought, oh, this is a job. You can do this. And uh, <laughs> and that's when I started to, you know, sort of toss it around in my head. And um, I will tell you the moment where I thought, this is this is amazing. This acting gig uh, is amazing. We went to Boston uh, to tour the show. And I must have been earning 200 bucks a week or something like that. And uh, I got a studio apartment of my very own. And I had never slept in a room alone my entire life. In Korea, we slept, the whole family slept in one room on the floor. And then when it came to America, I always shared a room with my brother. And then I went to college and I had roommates. I didn't know what to do with myself. I was in a room alone laying down. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and I thought, this acting gig, this is glamorous. Uh, maybe I'll stick with it. A few months ago, Cal Penn, your co-star in the Harold and Kumar films, posted um, on Twitter, posted a bunch of pages from some of the worst auditions that he's been asked to go on, you know, the worst mm. sort of stereotype parts that he mm-hmm. had to read for when he was starting out. <laughs> Do you have any memories of, like, the worst kind of stereotypical um, parts that you were going to try out for, audition for? You know, I um, early on I just started saying I don't want to go in for those. And um, I had no right to. I was I had no experience, I uh, had no standing in the business, as it were, but um, it struck me as um, not worth it to do that. But I remember being... Very early on, I can't remember what job it was, being asked to do something that I was slightly uncomfortable with in, politically in that sense. Um, and my memory of it, I can still feel in my bones, which is that I was asked to do something, that, I think it was laughing at an accent or something like that, making fun of an accent. But what people don't really see is, you know, when you perform that, particularly back in the day, there are no other people of color on set. It was all white men laughing at this joke about Asians. And I remember thinking, this feels terrible. This feels wrong. And um, I don't ever want to feel this again. And so I've tried my best to avoid those situations. We're listening to the interview Fresh Air producer Anne-Marie Baldonado recorded with John Cho, who stars in the new movie Columbus. After we take a short break, they'll talk about his role as Harold in the Harold and Kumar films. This is Fresh Air. 
Support for this podcast and the following message come from Morgan Stanley. For more than 80 years, Morgan Stanley has offered financial wisdom to its clients. And for the last few weeks, they've been offering financial wisdom on a brand new podcast. The Morgan Stanley Ideas Podcast will answer some questions you've wondered about for years and others you didn't even know you had. Find out on the Morgan Stanley Ideas Podcast, available from your favorite podcast directory. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC and Morgan Stanley and Co LLC members SIPC. One of your big roles was in the 2004 movie Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. Um, how did you come to get that role? Um, that role was um, based upon a guy named Harold Lee, who is a friend of the writers, and. Um, they wrote the movie with me in mind because Harold got mistaken for me all the time. And so uh, they, the, the, I met John at a screening and he gave me the script and I thought it was a hoax. Uh, <laughs> I thought there, no one's writing – no white guy is writing a movie for an Asia, a Korean-American guy. That's not possible, is it? This is a joke. Uh, it turned out to be real. And even when we got up to set and – I didn't a hundred percent believe that the movie was actually being made. It was so strange. Now I will say, so this is a raunchy stoner kind of comedy aimed towards young people. Um, but I think what's really interesting about it is that it complicated the image of Asian Americans in film. Um, can you talk about why you wanted to do this role? Was that part of it, sort of this complicating the image of Asian Americans? They can behave as badly as white kids, I guess? I, the basic answer is it was available to me. Uh, <laughs> it's not like, <laughs> it's not like I'm, I was turning down stuff. But yeah, it was really funny. It was really clever, uh, really raunchy, but really funny and smart. And it said things about race that were funny to me and were, um, that were insightful. Um, it, it, was, it was very insightful. And, and 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 it pushed back against certain stereotypes, and I like that. And it was specific, mm-hmm. you know. A um, little tidbit, like the the directors, uh, there was stuff in the movie that didn't quite make the cut. They had written in more verbiage about being Korean and being Indian. Um, they 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 wrote that stuff with a heavy hand because they were afraid that an executive at some point would try and, if they didn't do that, somebody would get the bright idea to change the character's race to white. Hmm. And so they felt, uh, as a defensive measure, that it would be wise to um, put as much cultural data in the script as possible so people wouldn't get that idea. Now, uh, you play Sulu, the character first played by George Takai, um, in the Star Trek reboots. Um, The most recent one was Star Trek Beyond. And in that most recent film, um, viewers learn that Sulu is gay and married and has a daughter. And I read that you were originally worried about the Sulu character being gay, not for you, but um, you were just worried about what the original Sulu thought. Um, what were your concerns? Well, primarily I was concerned that George wouldn't like it. And I thought that he would feel as though we were uh, doing a disservice to him as an actor because he's he portrayed a, a straight character and then later in life came out as gay. And then, and I felt that he would feel that we were conflating character and actor, and that he might mm. say, "Hey, I come out of the closet, and all of a sudden Sulu's gay. Is it because you can't see anything but gay now? Um, you know, if I come out of the closet, I felt that he might be sensitive about that, and that turned out to be incorrect. He was, he objected because." Um, it wasn't Roddenberry's, Gene Roddenberry, the creator's uh, vision. The original creator. The, the original creator. You know, looking back and having gone through it, I realized how positive it was and that people took it as intended, which was uh, a way to 
sort of expand Roddenberry's um, diverse universe, you know, to, to take it a step further than he could at the time. I also read that you um, were one of the people who insisted that Sulu's partner be Asian. Um, why did you want that to be the case? Well, um, you know, it was a little bit of a valentine to um, to my gay Asian friends. Um, you know, this may be presumptuous, but I feel like the family hang-ups prevent gay Asian men from loving one another because the shame leads them away from people who look like themselves. And um, so I wanted to posit a future in which, you know, that it mirrored more heterosexual relationships where there's no sh shame factor. And um, so I wanted to look heteronormal. Um, and secondarily, I just feel like Sometimes I feel like in American cinema, there's a lack of Asian people loving one another. And I myself am more often paired with people who are w women who are not Asian than Asian. And sometimes I wonder, is that healthy? Um, in any case, I felt that it, it was important for it to look, this gay relationship to look as, quote, normal as possible. Um, there was talk of initially was is this person human is this is this an alien hmm. um, and I said no it's, I, I I really want this person not, not only be human but to be Asian as well. Well, John Cho, thank you so much for joining us on Fresh Air. Oh, what a pleasure to talk to you. Um, it's uh, I uh, as I said, it's going to be a trip to see my own interview and my own podcast feed. John Cho spoke with Fresh Air producer Anne Marie Boldenato. Cho stars in the new film Columbus. He's in the new season, season three, of the Hulu series Difficult People. And in the fall, he joins the cast of the TV series The Exorcist. If you'd like to catch up on Fresh Air interviews you missed, like this week's interview with Max Brooks, the author of The Zombie Survival Guide and Minecraft The Island, and the son of Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft, check out our podcast. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our senior producer today is Sam Brigger. Our interviews and reviews are produced in... Ray is and not be scared of that or the kind of performer I was. You know, I, I needed to um, I needed to make a little cash. So what were the best and worst aspects of being a waitress? Like, what did you hate most when somebody behaved in a certain way or asked you for a certain thing? Yeah, what I hated was that I felt like... I should be on stage singing, and so I just started to resent everybody around me. And I was, you know, I was 42 and 40, you know, I think 42 or 43 when I quit waiting tables. And I'm like walking around, and there's all these 20 year olds, you know, that are have the same job as I do, and their future is looking so bright. And I'm like, God, am I, am I like, is this ever going to happen for me? It's like the only time I would ever question what I was doing, like, was when I was on the clock waiting tables. And people just, you know, they, most people are lovely, but there's just a lot of monsters out there <laughs> that don't, you know, they don't think of you as a human. Um, but I met some great people, and I got a really sick knowledge of wine when I was waiting tables. <laughs> <laughs> was that because you could drink it at the bar because you were supposed to taste it so you'd know what the wine menu was? Oh, yeah. They used to call me the wine whisperer because I could, you know, smell a glass and know, the, you know, the grape, the region, all that business. I've sort of lost that, but um, I took a lot of pride in that. And you're still drinking a lot of wine. You drink on stage. I was wondering, like, what's in Not the bottle? Not just on stage, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what's in the bottle. You know, is it water or is it scotch or is it wine? Uh, it's Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I, I love to drink Rombauer Chardonnay, um, but it's it's not cheap. So um, sometimes I have to downgrade a little bit. But yeah, that's um, that's Mother's Juice, and uh, I also like to have that at home when I'm sitting on the couch with my dog Poppy watching documentaries. Do I need to worry about you that you're drinking too much? <laughs> <laughs> probably. That's a, that's a probably a valid concern. I try to. Um, I have DNDNs. They're called uh, designated non-drinking nights, just to uh, try to keep myself in check. Because you mentioned your mother drank a lot, too. Yeah, she, um, but, you know, she quit the game 
probably a little too late, but she, she quit. And, um, yeah, she, uh, I come from a family of people that like to imbibe. Is that the right word? Yeah. It, it strikes <laughs> me that there's probably a fine line between drinking enough and drinking too much when you're on stage. Drinking enough to lose the inhibitions you want to lose, but not drinking so much that you actually lose your place. You know, that you lose, For sure. you lose your train of thought. You lose your command of the act. Yeah, I've done that before, and I don't like that. I mean, I, I, it's really, for me, it's about nerves. I get so nervous before I go on stage, so I have a little bit to, you know, I think it was um, Elaine Stritch that said, uh, why would I go out there all by myself or something like that, or I don't want to be out there alone. Um, but, yeah, there's, like, a certain amount that I know that I... Where it's where my it's my sweet key and herb and um, I was a big fan of um, Sweetie, who's a drag queen who passed away just a few months ago, and just like the sort of vital nature of their performance and just like the you know not to be corny but like the coloring outside of the lines kind of thing and crawling on tables and just you know sometimes just totally sick humor <laughs> but also. You know, the ones that I responded to were the ones that just had a, a lot of heart sort of pulsating underneath it. And, um, yeah, I didn't know that that existed living in Kansas and then going to school in Arizona. So um, they are constantly inspiring me, for sure. Um, what are the things that made you feel most different when you were in front of audiences, not, not gay audiences, but audiences who you felt weren't getting what you did? I think, like, I'm, I'm physically... A, I'm different. I don't see a lot of people on stage that look like me. I don't see a lot of people on stage that are, you know, wearing plunging, you know, a gown that goes all the way down to their navel that are built like me that are swinging, swinging it all around. You know, I think like I am. And then just like going out into the audience and just being like a, a, just a, a, a wild child. Like somebody used to call me a cabaret hurricane. It's like, um, I just didn't, see that and I just feel like um, I don't know why but queer audiences just ate it up and just and treated me like I belonged there My guest is Bridget Everett She stars in the new movie Patty Cakes We'll talk more after a break and we'll hear from actor John Cho co-star of the Harold and Kumar movies and the Star Trek reboot and star of the new movie Columbus I'm Terry Gross and this is Fresh Air <laughs> Support for this podcast and the following message come from Madison Reed, revolutionizing the way women color their hair with an ammonia-free formula in over 40 multidimensional shades delivered right to your door on your schedule. Because gorgeous salon-quality hair color is even more beautiful when it saves you time and money. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed is honoring Fresh Air listeners with 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with promo code FRESHAIR. During the years you wanted a singing career and didn't have one, you worked as a waitress. What kind of restaurants did you work? I worked at Ruby Foo's on the Upper West Side for 10 years. I opened it and closed it, and then I worked at a, another restaurant on the Upper West Side. Um, yeah, I waited tables or worked in a restaurant for, for 25 years before I finally got to quit about two years ago. That's really recent, two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It was... Um, I kept it a little bit longer than I might have needed to because I had health insurance, but I needed the money. I'm, you know, it's touring is like what who remains in a coma in the hospital. Do you think he's got a chance to recover, even if it's just enough to, to go back to Seoul? I hope not. What? The truth is, if I were in Korea, I'd be expected to be there when he died and to express sorrow in the most dramatic fashion. There's this belief that if you're not there when a family member dies and not adequately grieving, your spirit will roam aimlessly and become a kikri. A ghost. Of course, my dad didn't believe in that. Shit. Still, would be expected of me. John Cho, welcome to Fresh Air. Thank you for having me. 
So that scene in particular, you can um, feel the character struggling with what the right thing to do is, what it's like to be a dutiful son. And what's great about this movie for you, for people who followed your career, is that you get to do something that I don't feel like we've seen you do before, um, sort of get deep like this. Was that difficult? Was it sort of hard to sort of deal with these issues of family and obligation? I think particularly immigrant children have to deal with this uh, clash of cultures, what's expected from their parents from this culture that they didn't grow up in. I remember reading uh, as a kid uh, the Judy Bloom book, uh, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. Hmm. And I remember reading uh, Peter, the main character, was told to go to your room by his parents. And uh, he said, um, be glad to, and stormed off to his room. And I thought, wow, that was cool. And uh, I was told that by my Korean immigrant parents, go to your room one night. And I pulled that out of my hat. I said, be glad to. And promptly received a thrashing. It didn't go over <laughs> a full on the same way <laughs> as it did for it Peter. Was, uh, oh, you were in trouble then. Oh, you're in trouble now, kid. So, yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about that in some form, this cultural disconnect between uh, parent and child all my life. One thing that's interesting in the film is, you know, um, Jin's father, who's sick, was an architectural historian and architecture expert. Um, And at one point, Jin says that he hates architecture, Um, I think sort of as a reaction to what his parents... He started with a scene from Columbus... Jin and Casey, played by Haley Lou Richardson, are discussing Jin's dad, who remains in a coma in the hospital. Do you think he's got a chance to recover? Even if it's just enough to to go back to Seoul? I hope not. What? Truth is, if I were in Korea... I'd be expected to be there when he died and to express sorrow in the most dramatic fashion. There's this belief that if you're not there when a family member dies and not adequately grieving, your spirit will roam aimlessly and become a kikri, a ghost. Of course, my dad didn't believe in that shit. Still would be expected of me. John Cho, welcome to Fresh Air. Thank you for having me. So that scene in particular, you can um, feel the character struggling with what the right thing to do is, what it's like to be a dutiful son. And what's great about this movie for you, for people who followed your career, is that you get to do something that I don't feel like we've seen you do before, um, sort of get deep like this. Was that difficult? Was it sort of hard to sort of deal with these issues of family and obligation? I think particularly immigrant children have to deal with this uh, clash of cultures, what's expected from their parents from this culture that they didn't grow up in. I remember reading uh, as a kid uh, the Judy Bloom book, uh, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. And I remember reading uh, Peter, the main character, was told to go to your room by his parents. And uh, he said, um, be glad to, and stormed off to his room. And I thought, wow, that was cool. And uh, I was told that by my Korean immigrant parents, go to your room one night. And I pulled that out of my hat. I said, be glad to, and promptly received a thrashing. (laughs) <laughs> it didn't go over a full on the same way <laughs> as it did for it Peter. Was, uh, oh, you were in trouble then. Oh, you're in trouble now, kid. So, yeah, the, <laughs> I've been thinking about that in some form, this cultural disconnect between uh, parent and child all my life. One thing that's interesting in the film is, you know, um, Jin's father, who's sick, was an architectural historian and architecture expert. Um, and at one point... Sure their grandmothers you know i'm talking like on this last tour i did there were a lot of 
like roses for some reason. Be like, Rose, hey, Rose, what are you doing here tonight? How old are you? And I'm 90. And she would just like bring down the house every time. It's it's fun when you can get somebody like that to um, unlock and let go. Well, let's take a short break here and then we'll talk some more. If you're just joining us, my guest is Bridget Everett and she co-stars in the new film Patty Cakes. We'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. Support for Fresh Air and the following message come from the Platinum Card from American Express. There's a whole breathtaking and surprising world out there, and no other card lets you experience it like the Platinum Card, backed by the service and security of American Express. So um, I want to play one of your songs from this is the, from an album that you recorded, and this is a song you often perform in your act, and you did it on your Comedy Central special, um, mm. which was called Gynecological Wonder, which helps give <laughs> an idea that gives of you your a little, act. <laughs> a little taste, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, w- why don't you talk a little bit about Stay With Me? Um, you know, I wanted to... I wanted to play something beautiful, and I wanted to also play something that we could play on the air. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Stay With Me, I wrote with my guitar player, Mike Jackson, and I wanted it to be like last call at the bar and sort of have like... Um, a romantic 70s kind of vibe or something. And um, I, you know, I just, uh, I wanted it to be like a love song, but a love song that was on in my way of doing it. Okay. So this is Bridget Everett singing Stay With Me. Sit with me Don't be lonely tonight Oh, please Take my hand We'll dance under the moon As slow as we can No, stay right here Till the night is through Cause there ain't nothing in this world But me and you Cause tonight Your entire life In Korea, we slept, the whole family slept in one room on the floor and then when it came to America, I always shared a room with my brother. And then I went to college and I had roommates. I didn't know what to do with myself. I was in a room alone, laying down. <laughs> uh, and I thought, this acting gig, this is glamorous. Uh, maybe I'll stick with it. A few months ago, Cal Penn, your co-star in the Harold and Kumar films, posted um, on Twitter, posted a bunch of pages from some of the worst auditions that he's been asked to go on, you know, the worst Mm. sort of stereotype parts that he Mm -hmm. had to read for when he was starting out. Do you have (laughs) any memories of like the worst kind of stereotypical um, parts that you were going to try out for, audition for? You know, I... um... Early on, I just started saying, I don't want to go in for those. And um, I had no right to. I was. I had no experience. I uh, had no standing in the business, as it were. But um, it struck me as um, not worth it to do that. But I remember being very early on, I can't remember what job it was, being asked to do something that I was slightly uncomfortable with in politically in that sense. Um, and my memory of it, I can still feel in my bones, which is that I was asked to do something, that, I think it was laughing at an accent or something like that, making fun of an accent. But what people don't really see is, you know, when you perform that, particularly back in the day, there are no other people of color on set. It was all white men laughing at this joke about Asians. And I remember thinking, this feels terrible. This feels wrong. And um, I don't ever want to feel this again. And so 
I've tried my best to avoid those situations. We're listening to the interview Fresh Air producer Anne-Marie Baldonado recorded with John Cho, who stars in the new movie Columbus. After we take a short break, they'll talk about his role as Harold in the Harold and Kumar films. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Morgan Stanley. For more than 80 years, Morgan Stanley has offered financial wisdom to its clients. And for the last few weeks, they've been offering financial wisdom on a brand new podcast. The Morgan Stanley Ideas Podcast will answer some questions you've wondered about for years and others you didn't even know you had. Find out on the Morgan Stanley Ideas Podcast, available from your favorite podcast directory. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC and Morgan Stanley and Co. LLC, members SIPC. One of your big roles. Nah. What? Truth is, if I were in Korea, I'd be expected to be there when he died and to express sorrow in the most dramatic fashion. There's this belief that if you're not there when a family member dies and not adequately grieving, your spirit will roam aimlessly and become a kikri, a ghost. Of course, my dad didn't believe in that shit. Still would be expected of me. John Cho, welcome to Fresh Air. Thank you for having me. So that scene in particular, you can um, feel the character struggling with what the right thing to do is, what it's like to be a dutiful son. And what's great about this movie for you, for people who followed your career, is that you get to do something that I don't feel like we've seen you do before, um, sort of get deep like this. Was that difficult? Was it sort of hard to sort of deal with these issues of family and obligation? I think particularly immigrant children have to deal with this uh, clash of cultures, what's expected from their parents from this culture that they didn't grow up in. I remember reading uh, as a kid uh, the Judy Bloom book, uh, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. (laughs) And I remember reading uh, Peter, the main character, was told to go to your room by his parents. And uh, he said, um, be glad to, and stormed off to his room. And I thought, wow, that was cool. And uh, I was told that by my Korean immigrant parents, go to your room one night. And I pulled that out of my hat. I said, be glad to. And promptly received a thrashing. It didn't go over <laughs> a full on the same way <laughs> as it did for it Peter. Was, uh, oh, you were in trouble then. Oh, you're in trouble now, kid. So, yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about that in some form, this cultural disconnect between uh, parent and child all my life. One thing that's interesting in the film is, you know, um, Jin's father, who's sick, was an architectural historian and architecture expert. Um, And at one point, Jin says that he hates architecture, Um, I think sort of as a reaction to what his parent loved. I hate Benny Goodman, they, <laughs> they used to say. I prefer the Stones. So, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about that. I, and I was wondering if that factored into acting at all. Um, I'll put it out there, you know, Asian Americans sometimes get pushback if they want a career in the arts. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Madison Reed revolutionizing the way women color their hair with an ammonia-free formula in over 40 multi-dimensional shades delivered right to your door on your schedule. Because gorgeous salon-quality hair color is even more beautiful when it saves you time and money. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed is honoring Fresh Air listeners with 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with promo code FRESHAIR. During the years you wanted a singing career and didn't have one, you worked as a waitress. What kind of restaurants did you work? I worked at Ruby Foo's on the Upper West Side for 10 years. I opened it and closed it, and then I worked at another restaurant on the Upper West Side. Um, Yeah, I waited tables or worked in a restaurant for for 25 years before I finally got to quit about two years ago. That's really recent, two years ago. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. It was... um, 
I, I kept it a little bit longer than I might have needed to because I had health insurance, but I needed the money. I'm, you know, it's touring is like while you're sort of trying to tour around and not making a lot of money, you're just trying to get people to understand what cabaret is and not be scared of that or the kind of performer I was. You know, I, I needed to um, I needed to make a little cash. So what were the best and worst aspects of being a waitress? Like what did you hate most when somebody behaved in a certain way or asked you for a certain thing? Yeah, what I hated was that I felt like I should be on stage singing, and so I just started to resent everybody around me. And I was, you know, I was 42 and 40, you know, I think 42 or 43 when I quit waiting tables. And I'm like walking around, and there's all these 20 year olds, you know, that are have the same job as I do, and their future is looking so bright. And I'm like, God, am I, am I like, is this ever going to happen for me? It's like the only time I would ever question what I was doing, like, was when I was on the clock waiting tables. And people just, you know, they, most people are lovely, but there's just a lot of monsters out there <laughs> that don't, you know, they don't think of you as a human. Um, but I met some great people, and I got a really sick knowledge of wine when I was waiting tables. <laughs> <laughs> was that because you could drink it at the bar because you were supposed to taste it so you'd know what the wine menu was? Oh, yeah. They used to call me the wine whisperer because I could, you know, smell a glass and know, the, you know, the grape, the region, all that business. I've sort of lost that, but um, I took a lot of pride in that. And you're still drinking a lot of wine. You drink on stage. I was wondering, like, what's in the Not bottle? Not just on stage, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what's in the bottle. You know, is it water or is it scotch or is it wine? Uh, it's Chardonnay. Mm-hmm. I'm a, I, I love to drink Rombauer Chardonnay, um, but it's it's not cheap. So um, sometimes I have to downgrade a little bit. But yeah, that's Jeremy, the writer director of Patty Cakes, um, was involved in the Sundance Labs and thought that I should come and give it a shot. He saw me singing on Inside Amy Schumer and you know running around and you know being wild and stuff. And he's like, you should be the mother in my movie. And um, he kind of just took the pressure off. He's like, come to Sundance, you know. Don't worry about getting it wrong. Just come here, and and, and I I th- I think this is all going to work out. And so I just took the chance. Was there anything that you drew on as the mother in this movie from your own experiences, or from your experiences with your own mother? Yeah, you know, Barb is equal parts um, Bridget, frustrated as a waitress for many years, and and my mom, who you know was a single mother, and and bitter you know and sort of the the drinking part to um to get you through pain is not something that was too hard to um to uh tap into and then also the um you know I feel like Barb is really lonely and 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 you know my both my dad and sister had died a couple years ago and and I don't know I guess I just had some sadness I needed to work through, and and Barb kind of helped me do that. In the movie, your character, the mother, kind of blames her own daughter for the end of her singing career, for the end of the mother's singing career, because she was a single mother and she couldn't, she couldn't pursue her dreams. She had to raise her child. Yeah. And and the daughter knows this. It's like not the best way to establish a great relationship with your daughter to blame yeah. them for, for shattering your dream. It's so mean. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that your mother didn't do that to you. No, no, no. My mom didn't do that. But I can relate to blaming anybody but yourself, you know, for not achieving what you want. You know, I think that that's something that probably a lot of people can relate to. But um, my mom wasn't like that. I'm. I'm uh, I'm her favorite. <laughs> did, did did you have a list of people who you blamed for for a few years before you established yourself? Oh, just about everybody but myself. <laughs> I was like, the audience doesn't understand me. Comedy clubs don't want to, you know, they don't want to book me. Agents don't want me. You know, they don't understand me. You know, like there was, yeah, for sure, anger and frustration. Um, but I guess that's why I love the. You know, I loved the gay community so much because they just um, accepted me. So I want you to describe your cabaret act. Um, You know, it's sort of like a rock and roll, punk rock cabaret, lots of tender moments and money notes. And uh, add that sometimes in the middle of a beautiful ballad, 
She'll do something sexually crude. Her costumes are designed to comically reveal as much of her six-foot body as possible. In 2015, she received a special citation at the Obie Awards, the Off-Broadway Theater Awards. She's collaborated with Adam Horowitz from the Beastie Boys and musical songwriters Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman. Now she's co-starring in the new movie Patty Cakes. Her character, Barb, used to be in a local rock band that never made it. She's become bitter, relegated to singing at a local dive bar in New Jersey. Her daughter wants to make it as a rapper, but Barb is uninterested in rap and assumes that her daughter will also be crushed by her unfulfilled dreams. Here's a scene from the film. Barb is at the bar singing an 80s song. To a party last Saturday night I didn't get I got in a fight Uh Uh-huh It ain't no big thing But I know what I like I know I like dancing with you And you know what I like You know I like with you Come on Kiss me once Kiss me twice Come on pretty baby Kiss me daily Come on Kiss me once Kiss me twice That's Bridget Everett singing in the new movie Patty Cakes. Bridget Everett, welcome to Fresh Air. Have you sung, Hi, thanks for having me. Have you sung in a lot of bars like this one? Have you sung karaoke in a lot of bars? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's where I spent my formative years. I mean, by formative years, I mean my 20s and 30s. But yeah, I love a karaoke bar. So this role in Patty Cakes is, to my knowledge, your first big role where, like, you know, you, you, you're a leading character. Are there things you had to learn in preparation for the movie? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd never done a dramatic role before, and so I, and I've never taken an acting class or anything. But um, Jeremy, the writer-director of Patty Cakes, um, was involved in the Sundance Labs and thought that I should come and give it a shot. He saw me singing on Inside Amy Schumer and, you know, running around and, you know, being wild and stuff. And he's like, you should be the mother in my movie. And um, he kind of just took the pressure off. He's like, come to Sundance, you know, don't worry about getting a... He has, um, not worth it to do that. But I remember being very early on, I can't remember what job it was, being asked to do something that I was slightly uncomfortable with in politically in that sense. Um, and my memory of it, I can still feel in my bones, which is that I was asked to do something that I think it was laughing at an accent or something like that, making fun of an accent. But what people don't really see is, you know, when you perform that, particularly back in the day, there are no other people of color on set. It was all white men laughing at this joke about Asians. And I remember thinking, this feels terrible. This feels wrong. And um, I don't ever want to feel this again. And so I've tried my best to avoid those situations. We're listening to the interview Fresh Air producer Anne-Marie Baldonado recorded with John Cho, who stars in the new movie Columbus. After we take a short break, they'll talk about his role as Harold in the Harold and Kumar films. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Morgan Stanley. For more than 80 years, Morgan Stanley has offered financial wisdom to its clients. And for the last few weeks, they've been offering financial wisdom on a brand new podcast. The Morgan Stanley Ideas Podcast will answer some questions you've wondered about for years and others you didn't even know you had. Find out on the Morgan Stanley Ideas Podcast, available from your favorite podcast directory. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney LLC and Morgan Stanley & Co. LLC, members SIPC. One of your big roles was in the 2004 movie Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. Um, how did you come to get that role? Um, that role was... Um, 
based upon a guy named Harold Lee, who is a friend of the writers. And um, they wrote the movie with me in mind because Harold got mistaken for me all the time. And so uh, they, the, the, I met John at a screening, and he gave me the script, and I thought it was a hoax. Uh, I thought, there, no one's writing, no white guy is writing a movie for an Asian, a Korean-American guy. That's not possible, is it? This is a joke. Uh, it turned out to be real. And even when we got up to set, and I didn't 100% believe that the movie was actually being made. It was so strange. Now, I will say, so this is a raunchy, stoner kind of comedy aimed towards young people. Um, but I think what's really interesting about it is that it complicated